Hello, everyone. So we are starting now. Um, my name is Wen Long. Um, I'm assistant curator from the Inside Out Art Museum in Beijing. Um, good morning and good evening there. And I am Yusu, and I am a curating director at the museum here. And um, thank you for joining us today. And today's session is going to be in English. Um, today, we are very glad to invite Ken Lam um, to have a conversation with us. This talk is under the project from art to issue, from issue to art. And the project is a retrospective of the publishing history of 100 issues of issue journal. And Ken is the co-founder and it's editing, uh, founding editor in chief um, from 2002 to 2004. And we will first provide some context uh, regarding the museum and our project. And we will then pass the mic to Ken who will share his reflections on his trip to China in the 80s and 90s. And after that, you and I will have a conversation with Ken. Uh, a note to all of our audience, you are more than welcome to post your questions online. Let me give a few words about our museum. Beijing Inside Out Art Museum was founded in 2008. It is located in the Haidian district at the west of Beijing. Um, in recent years, we are returning to the artistic and intellectual practices in the second half of the 20th century in China. Our focus is on recognizing and articulating the historical process of Chinese contemporary art and uncovering the clues of the ideologies and artistic concepts that still affect us today. Um, another exhibition entitled Waves and Echoes, a process of recontemporization in Chinese art, circa 1987, revisited, is also on view in our museum space. Um, it is about Chinese art in the 80s and about the 85 new wave movement. And let me give um, a bit of a context on why we're doing this conversation. Um, so, um, this is a program that uh, stem out from our current exhibition that focuses on Yishu. Uh, and Yishu, a journal, was established in 2002 with a focus on producing and leading discourses on Chinese art for an English-speaking audience. It has now been printed for uh, nearly 20 years. And the journal is, is a premier journal in this English-speaking country devoted to contemporary Chinese art and culture. Uh, in November 2020, Yishu published its 100th edition, marking a milestone in the history of the journal. On this occasion, our museum's Inside Out practice presents From Art to Yishu and From Yishu to Art, a retrospective of the publishing history of the 100 issues of Yishu Journal. From the abstract and the all-encompassing concept of art to the practical work of the journal's viewpoints, editing, writings and publishing all of these specific uh, work of the journal's viewpoint. Um, all of these specific aspects of the journal have enriched our understanding of art. Yi Shu has become a community with more than a thousand contributors and feature practitioners as well as a countless enthusiastic reader of the journal around the world. Last year in December, we invited Zheng Shengtian, the founding manager editor, to share his story of Yishu. And today, we are delighted to have invited Ken Lam, who, had, who was the editor from Yishu's inauguration in 2002 to, to, to 2004. Later, um, on January 23rd, we will have a conversation with Keith Wallace, who was the editor from 2004 to 2020. We will also have a series of dialogue with other editors and frequent contributors. We will share these both on our social media platforms and in our physical spaces. Please stay tuned. And let me introduce um, Ken Lam. Ken Lam is an artist um, who has extensive international exhibition record, including numerous biennials and solo museum shows. He's the co-founder um, uh, and founding editor of Yishu Journal of Contemporary Chinese Art. He's a prolific writer having published in an area of academic and non-juried publications. He has also worked on or curated several large scale exhibitions, including the short century independence and liberation movement in Africa, 1945 to 1994, Shanghai Modern, 1919 to 1945, Shajar Biennial 7, and Monument Lab, Creative Speculations for Philadelphia, 
Lam is the co-founder of Monument Lab, a public art and history project. He is the Marilyn Jordan Taylor Penn Presidential Professor in the Stuart Weizmann School of De Design at University of Pennsylvania. Uh, so let me welcome Ken, and Ken, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much. Um, I'm so pleased to be here. Just a point of correction, I, I was not a co-curator of the short century. I was, a, I was one of the project managers of the short century. There was only one curator for, for, that, for that exhibition. Oakland Wazer. Um, I thought for uh, today what I could offer is um, maybe a kind of anecdotal um, memory lane of uh, my thoughts and reflections um, uh, having uh, first visited uh, China in um, 1984 and um, but somehow uh, growing up um, at a time in Vancouver Canada which was quite contrary to the conditions of um, uh, the Chinese in, in, in Vancouver, at least today. Um, at that time, when I grew up, uh, which would be in the uh, mid-1950s to uh, throughout the 1960s and 70s, uh, Vancouver w had a sizable uh, Chinese population, but it was really um, a population that lived within an enclave. It wasn't, it wasn't so spread out. Um, to many different sectors of the city. It only had one um, Chinatown. It didn't have multiple uh, Chinese uh, qu uh, quartiers or neighborhoods as you do today. There was all kinds of unspoken rules, um, not legal rules, but, uh, but social rules um, of the, uh, if you're Chinese or for that matter, other eth ethnic groups outside of the um, British. Uh, ethnic stock that you basically stayed within a certain area of the city. It wasn't like we weren't allowed to go to other parts of the city, it's just that it was part of the unspoken social cold that you just didn't. And so my life growing up in Vancouver, at least when I was very young, was very circumscribed to um, Chinatown and to parts of downtown that was not too far from, from the old Chinatown. Of course today, uh, or since that time, there's been massive uh, migration um, into Canada, particularly to Toronto and Vancouver, but many other Canadian cities as well, of um, China, Chinese from, from China, from Hong Kong, from all kinds of places, in, 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 including the interior of, of China. It's completely transformed uh, Vancouver. And in fact, um, and when I grew up, uh, the Chinese were generally very poor, and unlike, unlike today, and, and um, they never traveled. And, and of course, it was very difficult at that time for Chinese citizens within China to uh, get out of, um, out, out of China, which is very different again today. And so today I, I teach at the University of Pennsylvania, which is a prestigious Ivy League school. I think many people would recognize that, you know, the School of Design was the, uh, you know, place of the, uh, you might say the, uh, the, the founders of modern architecture in China, Lin and Liang. And um, so it, it, that also has an uh, illustrious history in terms, of, um, in terms of China. I wanted to uh, cover, um, I was given six prompts, which I'll, I'll just read briefly to you. The first is what motivated my first trip to China, which was in 1984. At that time, my mother was seriously ill and um, she died uh, in 85, but she urged me to um, go to China and find my roots, to uh, get in touch with my origins, which had always been um, uh, fascinating to me and also uh, challenging uh, uh, for me because I grew up and my grandfather would always say to me, you're, you're Chinese first, and, 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 but of course I was living in a, a very white society uh, at, at that time. And um, so having this kind of hybrid identity made it very, uh, it, it is a kind of special kind of identity. I don't, I don't think it's a, I think it's an asset, but it's also very challenging, especially when you're younger and, and so on. My mother was, um, was actually a Mandarin Chinese teacher who, um, uh, who led a quite tragic life because she was very um, educated, was very much into music. She was, a, in fact, 
knew a lot about Chinese music and, and read a lot of books and so on. But her life was to work in a sweatshop in, in, in Canada and then and, and died uh, quite young and so on. But she um, wanted me to uh, learn and my brother to learn Mandarin. But at that time, there were no um, Chinese schools in Mandarin. All, all the Chinese schools, the two that were there, was only Cantonese and only taught by locals who had been in Canada for a long time. So um, anyways, so in 84, I had, a, uh, an, I started to, you know, I was already an artist at that point and um, I had an exhibition in, in, in Japan and uh, I was sponsored to go to Japan. And so I thought this is a great opportunity for me to uh, travel to um, China, at least visit my cousins in Hong Kong and then to also go up to uh, uh, where my great grandfather still had a courtyard house in, in a neighborhood in, in Guangzhou. Of course, uh, maybe what I'll do is I'll share a screen just to give you an idea of what I, I first encountered at that time. So this is an um, image of uh, Guangzhou in, um, in 1984, right downtown. And this is very typical of uh, my experience. I, I remember coming through um, uh, uh, the gates in, in, in Hong Kong and, um, and literally hundreds and hundreds of people were behind these fences trying to, uh, uh, peering out uh, out of curiosity perhaps, but many also wanting to exchange money with me because I was bringing in uh, Hong Kong dollars and Canadian dollars and US dollars and so on. But um, at that time, um, you know, the kind of old colonial architecture of Guangzhou was, was very much in uh, evidence. Much of it's probably destroyed now. Um, there were, uh, the only uh, trans, uh, tra transportation was largely uh, bicycles or public transportation. Private cars were very few. There was a lot of taxis at the time, and that would also be for uh, privileges and so on. But I remember also that um, where I stayed, the, uh, you know, the skies was general, this doesn't show in this picture, but the skies for the week I was there was, was, was thoroughly blue every day. Um, and of course, um, with the industrialization that, that didn't uh, take effect anymore. And so, and that's not very long ago, uh, you know, 1984 to, to, let's just say 2000, which is the topic of this talk, within 16 years, the transformation was so Radical, we all know about that, so it's not something which I'm going to uh, kind of delve, delve into, right? But I remember um, going there and being very touched by um, my um, kind of getting into the, uh, my origins, going to, uh, uh, to the neighborhood, going to the courtyard where my family's ancestral home was, meeting someone who was very, very old at the time, I don't know how old, but very old, and him telling me that he knew my grandfather's great grandfather, and that was like quite stunning to me, because you go back and that's like um, what is that a hundred years um, uh, of lineage and so on, and but there was a kind of um, and I remember also thinking um, it turned out erroneously that at the time maybe maybe this system of um, of, of Maoism and so on is the best system because. There were just so many people. And of course, uh, and I thought, how could you distribute, how could you, uh, how could capitalism supply, uh, 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 you know, goods to so many people and so on. And um, of course, uh, China <laughs> proved me wrong in terms of its kind of creative potential and, and, and so on. And so 84 was a very, I was very young still, I think. and. Uh, and then uh, my next trip, and I don't remember why I was there, but my next trip it was was in the was only about three or four years later, and I remember going through um, Shenzhen, just north of uh, Hong Kong, and uh, it already had transformed quite quite a lot within three years, and um, the relationship of um, people to uh, was very different. They were very innocent. I remember uh, traveling uh, on this first trip, and um, uh, I went with my cousin in Hong Kong who was working in a, also in a sweatshop and he had saved up his money to buy a little black and white TV for his family, which was still on, on the other side of the border um, in, in China. And the, uh, one of the sisters of the, uh, one of his sisters, I guess, 
um, uh, yelled at him, angry at him for, for not buying a color TV and so on. So because he didn't, you know, he worked, he worked very hard to just save up just for the black and white TV. And then the sister um, yelled at him uh, for not think, for not caring enough to buy, buy a color TV. But I also remember at the time, TV was relatively new. Um, not everyone had one and there, uh, someone had a TV, a television set. And in the courtyard where my family's uh, home uh, was, it's ta long torn down. And um, they would make sure that the uh, TV was mounted in the living room facing the courtyard and the door the, and the windows would be, uh, uh, be open and there'd be all these people on chairs uh, in the courtyard watching this TV show and the TV show was very boring. It was just someone reading, <laughs> reading the news all day. There's very little real entertainment and so on. But you could already tell at that point that people had a real curiosity about the world because they were quite shut off from uh, the outer world. Although Guangdong province was a little bit privileged in, in the sense that it had access to uh, Hong Kong media and so on. But, but at that time, it, I, I, I'm trying to make the point that the, the kind of the closure, closing off of, of China, I think had a big, big uh, effect in terms of, of the way contemporary art unfolded in China um, by the, uh, certainly by the uh, end of the 1980s. I just want to go to the next image. And uh, just one more image. I remember I had a hotel, the Guangzhou Hotel, and my view was of the Haisu Bridge. And I didn't take this picture, this came off the internet, but I do remember this, uh, you know, on the, on, on the other side of the bridge would be equally crowded uh, groups of people uh, coming in the opposite direction on their bicycles. And I remember it was just kind of astounding, this, the, the, these kinds of spectacular scenes. I also remember how people were very, very kind. And I also remember um, going to, um, uh, you know, the first coffee shops, at least uh, uh, in China, and, and uh, they were serving coffee. They didn't quite know how to serve it. And, you know, the coffee was a bit too, um, too muddy, you might say, and, and, and so on. And uh, I, I would stay in the hotel and, and, and they had name tags. Many of them had Western names like Simon, um, Rocky. Um, I can't remember the other names, but everyone had a name tag and they'd come up to me in, in uh, you know, in, in uh, earnest English and say, hi, I, I'm, I'm Rocky. I'm here to, <laughs> I'm here to serve you and so on, and it was very touching. It was like this kind of opening up, uh, you know, of, 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 the wor of China to the world, you know, post, post Mao Zedong and during the era of Deng Xiaoping, of course. And it was, um, and, and there was a sense that anything was possible in a very good way. Anything was, uh, was possible because China was just this boundless uh, source of labor, energy, creativity, and curiosity. So again, by the this is only a couple of years later. By a few years later, by the early 1990s, you could already see you know buildings like this. Again, this is in Guangzhou, and um, and people were dressing much more Western and and so on. But by um, 1988, and I'm not sure. Maybe I know Zheng Chen Tian is here. I think this is Huan Ru. Is that doesn't look like Yang Ji Chang in a performance um, in 1988 in, in, in the Central Academy of Fine Arts in, in Beijing. And I think what was very interesting about this period, it was often called um, Beijing pop art. And I think using that term is actually uh, flattery to the West because the West in its uh, imperial fashion often likes to uh, read everything that develops outside of the West as, as mirroring at an earlier stage of development, something that took place in the West. And that's a very kind of colonial attitude because I think, you know, when consumption, when performance art, when, uh, you know, uh, the transformation of the economy uh, started to, to really take shape in, in China, it took place in its own terms. It didn't take place as a, as a, as a, as a kind of aspiration of trying to follow the footsteps of New York or Paris and so on. It was taking place under very specific, particularized 
um, criteria and 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 and, um, and circumstances that was endemic to China. And I think that's very very important to make that distinction. I teach in the university here, and and um, very often you t you speak to Americans, and it was and it's always always this argument that yeah we had pop art in the 60s, and then um, and then the then uh, the Chinese. Uh, had it much later, and the and the Russians had it a little bit before the Chinese, as if it's the same thing, when it's when it's when it should not even be compared on that level. You can speak about it in terms of the common common points, the kind of you know the the the, the placement of cap the entrenchment of capitalism within within a society, but but that's about it. After that, the particularities really need to be developed and theorized. And I, and I would say even to this day. Uh, those particularities have still not yet been fully theorized in terms of this entirely uh, entire uh, nascent period in, in, in China of, of this kind of fascination with, with with art and the ability of art to speak and, and to criticize um, and to foment thought um, through a kind of language which is aesthetic and and not um, not um, calligraphic and not textual. I think I think at least my view is that you know the kind of textuality, uh, textu the character of text is very, very has a primal um, um, uh, status within within China, whereas contemporary art and of course you also have the tropes of of a certain type of art, watercolor and uh, you know shirt paintings, landscape and so on. But contemporary art is a Western invention, and um, but it also became so globalized uh, by the um, 19, uh, late end of the 1980s, and that it became a kind of uh, repository of a lot of, of globalization itself. And I think that's what makes it very kind of interesting, this whole period in, in China, right? And of course, it bears, bears pointing out that all of this kind of uh, fomenting of activity around, around art and intellectual curiosity about Books from that was long banned in China, and, and people did not have access to uh, until you know until the um, later part of the 80s. Uh, all of that uh, is, is also uh, subsequent to a very you know traumatic period of the uh, Cultural Revolution, um, you know that culminated uh, in in 76 with Mao Zedong's uh, and Zhou I guess uh, Mao Zedong's death. And so I think that whole period of this transition of China from post-cultural uh, revolution with all its kitsch art and kitsch forms of art to um, the early 1990s, say, where suddenly you had a massive uh, investment in terms of capital, urbanized, massive urbanization, massive migration of people from the uh, uh, rural areas to work in factories and so on. And then you had a kind of, you know, uh, spring, uh, 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 springing of all kinds of creative activities, uh, 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 very much uh, evidence here in this in this picture. Um, that part has still not been really written, and really not been theorized. And I think uh, it's a golden opportunity. I mean, you have important texts, of course. Zheng Chen Tian has written about it, and and uh, Wu Hong, and all, but they're all generally. Um, isolated e essays. I'm talking about a real kind of comprehensive book that, or anthology that really theorizes this whole period from 76 to, let's just say, to uh, 1990 or 2000 even, is still not, it is still to be done. And I think that's a, there's so much rich, it's a very difficult story, it's a very complex story, but it needs to be done. Right, and again, I'm just, um, uh, and so, starting in the 1990s, I was lucky enough and um, to uh, ha have gone to China many times, in part because I, I had the great fortune of um, uh, meeting someone named Zhang Shantian. I thought um, I was I was my, myself maybe it was actually a bit later in, in into the mid 90s. I was myself also quite um, despondent. Uh, I, I had a very difficult emotional and mental period in the 1990s and and I was always and I had a very difficult time trying to believe in believe in art and I thought one way to at least save myself within art was to try to discover and learn more about art 
in faraway places that was generally outside of the so-called centers. And so I became involved in NKA Journal of uh, Contemporary African Art. I wrote an essay on uh, multiple identities uh, 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 in, um, on, on the raft of Medusa, which is a ship that was shipwrecked in, uh, off the coast of Senegal in West Africa. I got to, I met uh, Okui in Wazer when I was teaching in Paris uh, in the mid 90s and uh, became involved in projects uh, with him. And, um, and of course, with Zheng Chen Tian, um, you know, uh, with Art Beatus Gallery in Vancouver, I, uh, you know, I, I, I continued to uh, learn and uh, so much from him, but I was very curious about uh, China and, and uh, he provided me an opportunity to uh, learn more about China through the 1990s. I knew that, um, uh, I just have so many stories, it's sometimes hard to filtrate uh, what are the proper stories to say. Um, all of this, of course, led to um, the, uh, uh, I would say that throughout the 1990s, you know, as, you, as many of you know, or maybe not, because many of you are very young, probably, but it was nothing but a construction site. I think I saw uh, Philip Tenari's name here. And I, but I remember going to um, like Shang Art, and, uh, you know, which is an important gallery, historically as well, in China. And it wasn't really a, a gallery in terms of a physical space. It was within the, I can't remember the, I can't remember the hotel, but it was a five-star hotel lobby. And, uh, and, and, and works of art would be shown there. So there was a kind of um, interest in contemporary art well before there was an infrastructure for contemporary art. And I think that made it quite interesting in a way because, you know, if you have an infrastructure for contemporary art, then everything is already kind of institutionalized, right? Spatially and and and, and in language and, and and so on. So the re, you know the kind of um, exhibition mode is already predetermined. But if you don't have that infrastructure, then everything come, uh, is called into question. You know, including of course exhibition mode, right? Because there weren't real galleries at that time of, of sufficient number to to show show contemporary art, right? And yet at the same time. Contemporary art is a very elusive and protean form that is uh, that can also shake up and challenge notions of space and, and theories of being. And so I think all of that worked for the benefit of making for a very rich um, Chinese contemporary art scene right off the bat. Because often uh, qu the, the question uh, that I've heard is that how could, um, you know, how could China go from a very, uh, you know, a, an area where there is no interest in contemporary art, right, that uh, in which the state advocated a kind of, you know, Soviet style socialist realism art. And then in a very quick, short time, become a real leader in contemporary art. And I think, I think, in a way, con contemporary art, at least contemporary art as as a quest, as a continuation of the modernist pursuit of the of the uh, relationship between art and politics, um, merged also with what I said: this lack of infrastructure for contemporary art, this lack of uh, institutional frames for contemporary art, and that made it even more possible. For example, if you had a gallery and the gallery was um, uh, was was known as a gallery and you were showing uh, there, then it becomes institutional, but it also becomes under surveillance of, of the government, right? But the open-endedness of contemporary art in, this, in, in the face of a lack of infrastructure also uh, meant that, you know, um, forms that were not tailored for a gallery space, you know, the white wall space that you see in 798 district in Beijing today, it meant that alternative forms of practice such as that image of um, Hu Han Ru doing a performance, all of that was highly possible. And in fact, it, because of the lack of infrastructure. So I think that makes it very, very kind of interesting. Um, I just, just showing you images, I don't want to get into all this, right? But um, right, uh, again, you know, from model operas and, and this kind of criticism, uh, you know, the Westernization is kind of merger between, uh, you know, uh, Chinese kitsch forms of art, like posters and so on, with uh, Coca-Cola 
and, and, and so on. But even I would say, even within the form of like Chinese model of opera, there was already a kind of kitsch pop. It lent itself to pop art in a very kind of due to its earnestness, due to its, you know, um, lack of um, irony, which is some, somehow ironic as well. Right. And uh, here's uh, uh, Zhang Te Li, who was, uh, of course, a professor at Jingjiang Academy of Art. Um, you know, this, this very important piece, uh, which is shown at the Guggenheim Museum in New York, where, uh, you know, this uh, very famous uh, newscaster was reading the definition of water over and over again during a time uh, uh, of, um, as a criticism of the um, non-acknowledgement in terms of the public news of the events of Tiananmen Square in 1989. And so I knew um, I, I was I, I knew that I, I was felt that I was in a very lucky position to know more and more and more about um, uh, uh, Chinese art at that time, and really see, not just Chinese art, but also to see the transformation in Chinese society today. And in a way, I feel luckier than you see in Wen Long because I feel like I actually saw. Uh, so much of China before this transformation. I think people with, who are very young in China today, they, they, they maybe can't fully appreciate uh, the, 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 that, that transformation and so on. And I wanted to uh, just speak about the Shanghai Biennale as well. In, in, in the year um, 2000, the Shanghai Biennale, I'm just showing you this picture uh, of Sai Kuo Zhang's piece in the Shanghai Biennale just to underline how popular it was in terms of the public. I'm talking about a public that had never seen contemporary art. I'm talking about a public that didn't, didn't really was familiar with contemporary art. I remember going to a, a, a video uh, room in the Shanghai Art Museum, and there was an old man there in, an, in a mild jacket, right? And uh, I was, was a translator, someone who spoke, spoke Chinese and English, and I said, can you just ask that old man why he's sitting there so long watching this video? And you know what he said to me? And I never forgot it. He said that I don't understand what this work is, but I, but I know it's the future, right? And he just sat there and watched it, and which I, which I found, found totally moving, right? And so it was like this thing. It was like this wholly new, it was like first contact, you might say, in this kind of encounter of masses of people uh, trying to look at this thing and suspending even the question of what what art was, right? And and I think that's important because when art, the status of art, the definition of art, the framing of art dissolves, then suddenly you have moments of enchantment. You have real moments of delight and awe in the, in that pure relationship of of receiving this experience through through art. So that's why I want to show this this picture. And, uh, and at that time, there was a lot of mischievous sideshows. One was, uh, you know, uh, Fuck Off, which was not too far away uh, from the Shanghai Art Museum, which was uh, quickly closed down. But the point was, there was this sense of, um, of real possibilities of expression, including criticism, including all kinds of um, taboo subjects that was, that was not um, allowed um, in earlier uh, times. And, um, and there was only a sense of, of uh, that hope and, and an enormous aspiration. And I cannot underline how, how hopeful it was um, at that time. And of course, a lot of, I also want to say, a lot of that hope was also, uh, had a di different registration. The, the hope was also, you know, the, the way the, the West in arrogantly also tried to imagine China for itself. So that they would, they saw China as a market. They saw China as as developing uh, in a Western sense of of how they how they imagined themselves in its most ideal forms. And of course, uh, that doesn't that always creates problems because it doesn't recognize China for for its for itself uh, uh, for its, in terms of its own sovereignty in in terms of its own terms. And then. Um, by um, in, in 2000, I also uh, ended up um, guest teaching uh, uh, a few, several weeks at, in, um, in Hangzhou. This is the original uh, um, uh, China Academy of Art building, Zhejiang Academy of Art. It was very small. It was uh, modeled, it was a very beautiful campus, modeled on 
Bauhaus architecture, very interlocking buildings, and so on. And uh, I was I was so grateful that uh, and no computers. There's only one tiny little um, Apple computer in the director's office, and it was very very slow, super slow connection. <laughs> you know, if I sent an email, it would take like 15, 20 minutes. It was just unbelievably uh, slow. But I remember going there, and during the uh, day, there was all kinds of um, traditional instruction. But then once the, um, outside of my own class, once the, um, uh, you know, the, the day ended, so to speak, which was late afternoon, around four or five, five o'clock in the afternoon, then suddenly a lot of the students took out art forum and took out all these um, Western books. You know, at that time, like Julian Schnabel and David Sally and, and German expressionist painting and, and so on. And, and they had all these books out. And, right, and they were studying all these things. And I remember thinking, this is incredible because during the day they weren't really, uh, I'm not sure whether they weren't allowed, but it was certainly de-emphasized that during the day you, you stick to traditional tropes of Chinese art, watercolor and, 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 and you know, landscape and figure drawings and so on. And it was a kind of a fantastic way to become an artist because you learn two systems, one by day, one by night, or one by evening. And, uh, and you became a kind of master of both, which allowed you to negotiate uh, between the two. I don't know how, whether I'm taking up too much time or, or what, but anyways, and of course, um, I went back uh, to uh, Hangzhou a very short time later. And uh, you know, this was the first of the many buildings, multiple campuses that, that started. But before I even go there, I, I, I remember speaking to the uh, China Academy of Art High School and um, I went there and everyone was about, um, you know, 14 years old, very young kids, and they all spoke perfect English. I remember, you know, uh, there was like about maybe a hundred children, they all spoke perfect English. And I remember, uh, whereas like in China, Art Academy, I had to have a translator with me all the time. And uh, I remember thinking, yeah, this is, this is going to be unbelievable, this, the China century, the China millennium. But, I was a bit saddened when the new building went up because it was so, I mean, I understand there's growth, but it became this kind of machine. It became this kind of, um, it, it didn't have the kind of delicacy of the earlier building. It was, it, it, you know, suddenly you, from one computer, you had a, I remember Sony Corporation donated something like a couple hundred computers. Um, and suddenly it was like super high tech. It was like a gigantic, campus. And I think, I don't know, I, I mean, maybe it's not fair for me to say, but within that, I think there was a kind of, um, I sense a kind of risk, the, 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 the kind of professionalization of art, the kind of losing of a kind of um, more intimate, pure, perhaps, if I can put it that way, sense of uh, contemporary art. And of course, this is, um, you know, the, uh, you know, I think I don't remember, I read some numbers like tens of thousands of applications for very few positions uh, to be, be a student in the academy, uh, in the um, China Art Academy in, in Hangzhou. And I look at this picture, which I took off the internet, and I remember um, something similar in Hangzhou at that time. And uh, it, you didn't have this much work, you only had one. Uh, drawing per person, they were all kind of laid out uh, in this room, it wasn't nearly as big as this. And then suddenly they, they, some old guy, very old guy, it, was, it looked like something out of Hollywood actually, long beard, he looked a little bit like Ho Chi Minh, and he walks in and he walks in with a cane and two people are kind of supporting him as he walked into the room. And uh, he has his cane and he goes like this and he just flicks the cane, he goes like this, and those people, he flicked, said, those are the people that get in <laughs> or accepted, right? So he was like the juror. He was like the judge, you might say. And, um, and so I asked, um, you know, I asked uh, 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 the translator, through the translator, uh, like, how, how uh, he's the only juror for, 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 the, for these uh, people? To, and, and, um, and I was told, yes. And I said, but, but why? And he said, because he's a great artist. And I said, 
And I said, well, what, made, what makes him a great artist, right? I wasn't disputing, I was just wondering. And, and, he, and I was told he's a great artist because he's been at his practice for a very long time. And I thought that was like, a, that's like really, really a beautiful, uh, you know, uh, experience for me at that moment. And then, um, you know, I, I want to say, um, you know, my life kind of changed because, you know, uh, Zheng Chen Tian wanted to start this uh, Yishu Journal of Contemporary Art. And I was flattered. He asked me to be the um, founding uh, 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 editor. It was all done uh, with, uh, you know, no salary, no fee, no payment. And uh, it was a really a, wor a work of love. And I was really interested in in, in this moment where, you know, I, China had a lot of art going on. A lot of Western collectors were already setting their sights in China, a lot of curators. But one thing that was not really developed within China, and I would even say even today, it still needs further development, is um, critical writing. And I mean, I don't just mean reviews. I'm talking about critical writing, like real serious, long academic essays that theorize um, the emergence of Chinese art in the context of the changing political circumstances in China. So I'm talking about books like that um, and, and long essays like that still needs to be still needs to be uh, written in a very kind of compilational way. As I said earlier, there are essays, but not not in a kind of comprehensive um, essay, and that that still needs to be done. And so um, you know. Uh, I thought this was a great opportunity uh, to be uh, able to go to China again through Yishu. And, and again, I'm grateful to uh, Zhang Tian, especially um, to, for, to, to um, ask me to be the, the uh, founding um, editor in this. And um, around that time, actually, we, uh, you know, there was an um, opportunity to go and, and uh, Zhang Chen Tian organized uh, by and large the International Curators Tour. And the International Curators Tour, I invited some, uh, uh, I had contacts in terms of major Western museums, so I invited several people I knew, including um, Okwe and uh, Chris Durkan of the Vit de Vit, uh, no, uh, of the uh, Museum Boymans in Rotterdam, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Sebastian Lopez of the, Gate, of the then Gate Foundation, and so on and Lynn Cook of Dia Art Foundation. These were like major, major Western uh, curators. The, and uh, of course, Oakley was already working on his Documenta 11 exhibition. And we went from uh, several cities and, and uh, we were it was one of the most fascinating times we were, um, you know, uh, there's too many stories to say, but I can tell you that you know, um, I remember, um, maybe Zheng Chen Tian remembers better than me, but I remember being in um, uh, Beijing and, and meet, meeting Yang Fu, uh, Fudong and Yang Fudong was serving everyone tea. And, um, but he was not on the uh, roster of, a uh, of artists to be visited. And, um, and then someone mentioned, uh, I think this is the story, someone mentioned that, uh, you know, you should see Yang Fudong's work. Right, and so of course the rest is history, and the the cur curators loved loved his work and became a very important artist uh, after that point. So, it, and also um, there was um, a sense that there was a lot of, that that this curators tour was suddenly known throughout China at the time, and uh, and there was a lot of people trying to uh, follow in the path of trying to get in, uh, get a studio visit, get a meeting. With the with the group of curators, it was really quite exciting. Of course, that's impossible because, you know, that would you know, there's only so many so much time they had, and so many people they can they can see. But I remember it was a kind of a massively uh, exciting moment uh, uh, that was very well known throughout much of China, at least the art scene that was emerged throughout much of China to try to get in and try to get these meetings with these uh, international. Um, curators. And then um, I think there was a, uh, and then uh, just very quickly, because I know I have to come to an end. Um, the idea for Yishu uh, wasn't my idea. The idea was, uh, was uh, Zheng Chen Tian, but I was certainly receptive to being the editor. I wanted to 
shape it uh, to, in, in, in my way as well. And, um, and, but the idea was to at least um, create a publication whereby it would be um, a documenter of all kinds of um, panels and colloquia and conferences, um, even in, in transcript form, that, was very, that would be historically important. And uh, I think that's one of the great, great um, things about Yishu is that it records many of these early uh, 2000 conferences verbatim as a kind of transcript. And, and they uh, have been recorded and otherwise it would have been lost. You would have had these conferences and there wouldn't have been any transcript. And of course they were translated into English for the wider audience outside of, of China. <clears throat> and also, um, Yishu we saw as a possible repository for the theorization of art to keep, keep uh, you know, art not just as something which is not to be, uh, it, that is something to be experienced bodily in an exhibition space, but also something to be reflected upon through words and, and to discuss and, and the kind of freedom of words to be able to convey uh, you know, notions of, of real ex deep, deeply felt free expression, right? And, and, uh, and to theorize the historical moment of change that has visited upon China over, over the course of, uh, of these past several decades. So uh, I'm just gonna end it right there. But at that time, um, there was enormous um, openings and enormous uh, hope and uh, possibility and potential, and um, and and belief um, in in the kind of future progress of China to be ever more um, free in terms of the expressive possibilities of thought, and Jishu would be the journal of record that would accompany that recording of uh, artistic and political thought and language. So thanks very much. Thank you very much for your talk and it's very inspiring and also very personal account. Um, we have prepared a few questions for you. Uh, meanwhile, if any audience has questions, please post it um, in the chat box. Um, so um, you mentioned you were teaching in Zhejiang Academy of Art um, in 2000. Uh, what were you teaching there? Well, what I was trying to teach was, um, the, you know, what makes Western art Western? That was the class I was teaching, right? Because I, I come from that, uh, you know, formation, right? And so I wanted to talk about this, including kind of, um, you know, quite the, the you know, dialectics of modernism, how art is negotiated with, uh, with politics, and the uh, and um, you know all these dialectics and di uh, binaries such as negative space, positive space, um, image text, and so on. And I spoke also about um, you know the especially uh, 1960s avant-garde in Europe and in uh, America, starting with pop art, right? But maybe even before that, with uh, Neil Dada, with Jasper Johns, and and so on. It was very kind of classic. Um, uh, approach to to uh, the class, and I introduced the students to to that. And um, because I only had a few weeks there, I was only there I think barely a month, maybe even shorter. And um, it was like almost every day, and uh, it was a very popular class. I remember uh, when I was teaching there, um, uh, one one day uh, a pizza hut opened in downtown uh, Hangzhou, and and so I said. Let, we'll take you out to Pizza Hut after this, <laughs> after the class, and that was a uh, big memory. But yeah, I, I was just kind of doing, um, you know, a kind of re retelling of uh, of of the, of the you know narrative of Western art. How did contemporary art? What are, what are the kind of antecedents of contemporary art? How did it come to that point? Thank you. Actually, I was wondering because you mentioned earlier that. You said, um, correct me if I was wrong, but you said that modernism and contemporary art was not allowed to be taught during the day of the 
uh, the courses in Zhejiang Academy of Arts. So how was that? Um, how was that possible to happen? Like, what role were you kind of doing as a guest teacher? No, and no, I, I didn't want. I didn't want to make it seem like it was absolutely foreclosed. I don't. I, I'm just saying that from my visit, it's purely anecdotal. I didn't get a sense there was, uh, you know, what Western art was really taught, right? As Western art, that's all. I, so maybe it was, and but certainly it was tolerated because I know that in the once the you know the day classes ended which was in late afternoon, there was a lot of, um, lot of um, uh, books that would come out. And I remember, I think I remember walking through with uh, Zhang Chen Tian and seeing all these Western books and all come put up in terms of the students' uh, ateliers and, and so on. So it wasn't like somehow that it was forbidden. It was just, I didn't really see it so much. And of course, I'm, a, you know, I'm, I'm Chinese ethnically, but I'm also a Westerner. And so I would come in there with a with a very maybe a different perspective, right? Uh, maybe a more of a first-hand perspective in terms of uh, in terms of, uh, of contemporary art. And then, how was the reception to your class, and how did your students respond to your teaching? Um, well, it, they were my my. It, it was a little bit awkward because I would say, you know, they. In China, maybe maybe it's still like that, but they, uh, my sense was, unlike here in the United States, there's a real um, reverence for the teacher. <laughs> you know, they many of them were shy to contest. You know, and so on. it was very hard to come uh, for me at least because partly it was out of translation, which was also a barrier, but also I was trying to um, convey difficult topics and so on. And um, I think it went very well towards the end, but you know, it was only after, after, just before I was leaving that I got that sense. But for a very long time, it was like, um, they were, it was very quiet and very, um, very, um, you know, reverential to the, to the professor. You know, the professor was like this, whatever the professor said, I, I could have made up things and the professor, they would have believed me and so on, right? Which is, which is not how I, um, it, 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 the culture is in terms of um, the United States. I mean, I think the United States could use a little bit of, of that, but here, you know, students could yell back and say, uh, why do you say that? And so on. And there's none of that. It was very obedient, very, you know, quiet and, and so on. Thank you. And, um, um, I have a question regarding, let's go back to um, the issue journal. Um, so how do you, how would, how like, so you were the editor for two years from 2002 to 2004. How did you structure the content of the journal for the two years? And how did you find writers in the 2000s, and especially in the early 2000s? It was, uh, I have to say it was very difficult because, um, and, and maybe uh, Judge and Tian can offer uh, more, but you know, we kind of started, the, the, the journal was already start well on its way before we actually had built up, um, uh, you know, a, a lot of inventory of, uh, of essays and content and so on. And so that made it a bit, Difficult, right? Because you, you usually what you want is you want to make sure that you have enough for th things are always in the work and you know for two or three at least two or three issues um, ahead, and uh, we didn't really have that, right? So it was quite precarious. But but there was also a sense, um, at least my reading, um, that there was an urgency to and need to get uh, the issue off. Right, so you might say that you know Yishu was like the cart that started just before the horse, right? To to a degree, the horse being the content. So that was that was quite exhausting. To try to get uh, enough writers, and of course, you know enough writers uh, who uh, you know that we, we could transcribe. It was in Chinese, and then it was very difficult to try to transcribe. Also, uh, someone securing someone who could transcribe in a very competent and sophisticated way but one of the first things that we uh, uh, we wanted to do certainly by the second issue was to, to devote uh, one issue to the theme of the cultural revolution because i was especially interested as i said earlier in my preamble uh, what what is what are the tentacles that link up 
uh, you know, the 1960s and 70s in China, right, the, you know, decade of the Cultural Revolution, to the emergence of contemporary art in China, right, because I think that was very important, right. I also think, by the way, um, you know, the, uh, you know, Tiananmen Square 89 and post Tiananmen Square, that's also very important to the history of, uh, you know, not just politically, but to contemporary art and the shape of it in China, because so many of the Chinese artists uh, ended up in, in the West, like uh, Shen Chen and Yang Chi Chang and, uh, yeah, and, uh, and so on. And all these artists, many of them were, you might say, uh, you know, were, were over in Paris, uh, affiliated with the uh, Magician de la Terre exhibition when Tiananmen took place. And so you have this kind of very, and Hu Han Ru and, 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 and so on. And so you have these very smart artists uh, suddenly kind of, um, you know, domus out in the West and, um, and uh, cultivating a very kind of negotiation, very taut negotiation of a double language art that spoke critically of, of China and spoke critically of the West. And uh, much of the best work from that period, and so much of it was fantastic, was co constantly ricocheting between these two poles and very elusive in terms of its um, say, political uh, specific uh, message. And, but that, that, that elusiveness was, was what made the work so intriguing. They really kind of um, challenged um, contemporary art understanding in the West, just as they challenge um, it in China. And that was a really kind of an amazing generation of artists from the 80s through to the, uh, through to the uh, 90s. Yes, thank you. Uh, since you are the founding editor, so in what ways do you think it should distinguish itself from other publications? Well, I think uh, Ishu um, didn't wasn't so fettered in terms of uh, what we could uh, put in as content, right? Because it was uh, you know edited in, outside of China, and it, it was covering China specifically for and in English too for the larger um, audience outside China. And it became the uh, publication of record uh, for Westerners who were curious about this, this growing fascinating world of Chinese contemporary art, right? You couldn't, you couldn't there was no better um, um, China specific journal than Yi Shu. You had Art Asia Pacific and so on, but they were, but it was like covering, of course, centered largely on China, but so much of it was about Asia, right? So they were always, in terms of its, uh, in terms of its reason for being, it was a little bit very broad. And it also, um, but you know, um, but Yishu was a very serious journal. It, it, you know, it was, it, as I said, we covered uh, transcribed early conferences. There was like uh, amazing kind of interviews with, with you know, first generation uh, contemporary artists and curators of China. And all of that is now part of the public record, and that was it. That has been an invaluable service, I think, and uh, that Yishu has performed. Thanks, uh, as again, largely to Zhang Tian. How uh, may? So in the first issue of Issues Journal, you posed um, three questions to the international scholars and Chinese artists. And um, if you remember, you know, they answer, and um, that was kind of the opening of the, um, the journal, actually. And um, so we'd actually um, like to ask these reflections um, and questions uh, back to you. And um, so what does China mean to you? And what is your scope of Chinese contemporary art? And I will um, post um, the three questions that was um, proposed to the writers on the journal in the chat box for um, our audiences. Right. Uh, well, the first question being, what does China mean to me? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, uh, well, if, if, if you mean today, as in 2021, I would say I'm, not, I'm less optimistic than um, I was. And I, think my optimism of Chinese contemporary art was um, a little bit um, too positive uh, when I 
And, uh, and of course, I'm not talking about the kind of uh, courageous kind of transformation, modernization of the state, right? That's not what I'm talking about. Uh, or even there, you could, you could say there's, you know, the question of social inequity is very stark, right? And of course, when I say that, I recognize social inequity is, is, is very much an issue where, where I live now in the United States. So I'm not trying to say that somehow when I say that, I'm, um, uh, I don't recognize what's going on here as well. But I would say, I remember um, there, was a, there was this, I had this incredibly profound sense that everything would change for the better and it would lead to greater freedoms, greater expressive capacity, greater, um, you know, less um, surveillance, you might say, of, in terms of what can be said and what, what, uh, what can't be said and, and, uh, and so on. And of course, that's not what happened, right? On the one hand, you had greater and greater kind of material development, but you didn't have a commensurate um, progress in terms of the kind of, uh, you know, a kind of uh, liberty of expression. So I think um, I think that's a little bit not not that good, right? And uh, I mean I can say as a Westerner I don't want to get, get too political, but I'm not I'm not too um, you know I'm not too encouraged by what's going on right now with the with the leadership in China. Let's put it that way. So that's my situ That's my. Uh, but I always think it's and I still think that the uh, uh, you know uh, the kind of repression of intellectual thought is very much alive in, in China. I think there's amazingly smart people there, right? But, it, but it's also quite astounding that, you know, uh, not just uh, writers of, of, of art, but also writers of novels, writers, it's actually very, it's, it's not that much, given, given how great the, the country is and great, given how kind of amazing uh, the intellectual potential of the country is all of that is uh, highly compromised in the in the present setting so that's my thought on um on the situation of art and uh, culture in china now what does chinese art and culture mean to you well chinese art and culture means uh, a lot to me when i was very young i i actually was even uh, there were moments when i was a kid when i was kind of embarrassed by uh, my mother's activities right my mother always served me strange uh, medicinal soups and um, took me to uh, you know Chinese opera, which is very uh, kind of amateur opera in in Chinatown. Uh, you know she loved it, and uh, I hated it. I thought it was just all noise and so on. And uh, as but as I grew older, I real I kind of realized I that was all misplaced on my part because when I grew up, it was very poor. Every every Chinese person I knew in Vancouver was poor. I didn't know anybody was. And I thought that was that was a lot of the Chinese in in at least in Vancouver was that they they were they were all poor they were all working in factories and and they were the second class uh, citizens and so as a child I I wanted to break out of that and so uh, I and uh, I I think when I'm when that's not something which is uncommon among a lot of a lot lot of immigrant kids and and so on but as I grew up. I appreciate it more and more. Um, I listen to a lot of Chinese opera <laughs> right, right now, and I try to instill it with my my son. We even uh, ha have him go to uh, Mandarin school, and so on. So, and um, and he knows a lot about Chinese music, for example. And um, so I'm very proud of it. Right. Although in this moment, I mean, only a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago, you know, I, I since I was a little kid, I. I hadn't had someone um, really attack me for being Chinese until only a month ago here in Philadelphia, you know, um, because of the, uh, you know, the virus. And uh, this, I went to a shopping uh, supermarket and some white guy was just kind of yelling at me and calling me all kinds of racial names. It was just really nasty. I hadn't, I hadn't had that happen since I was, you know, 11 years old, a long time ago. And so, but I'm proud, proud of being Chinese, you know? And, uh, and I also have to say that I wrote an essay about that, that I mean, when, after I went to China, I didn't really, I thought I'd, you know, because I'm from, ethnically from Southern China, I, I saw a lot of people that look like me, you know, you know, there's a Southern Chinese features. 
And, uh, but I didn't identify with them. And then uh, I realized um, uh, sometime later that who I really identified with, with were, were Chinese in Chinatowns all over the world. It didn't matter. It, was, it could be a Chinatown in Rome, not, you know, didn't speak English, spoke Italian and Chinese. And I identify with them more than, and I, talk, I talked to the late uh, Shen Zhen, uh, Chen Sen, uh, the great Chinese artist, about this. And uh, he, he was totally fascinated by that. Um, you know, and um, in a way, I, I, I don't see that as somehow being less Chinese and it was just being Chinese in the West, you know, and, and, and if you come to the Americas, I mean, you know, Cuba, Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, you know, uh, Trinidad, I mean, it's unbelievable how, you know, the kind of Chinese lineage, uh, which has been pro Peru uh, throughout the West, it, you know, it's been around for like at least 100 years. Right, in part because of you know the uh, opium wars, but also because of this the turmoil in China in the you know early part of the 19th century, and, and, and forcing a lot of Chinese to become uh, contract laborers around the world, particularly in the West. And then, um, and given the fact of globalization, both in terms of capital markets and culture, and the increasing number of Chinese participants, in fact, what are your thoughts regarding the implications of this? Well, I think there. I think uh, it's it behooves. Um, it's incumbent on the younger generation of Chinese to really kind of um, embrace and learn more about what happened in China. Uh, not just, of course, if you can go back to the Qing Dynasty, the end that last day, the Qing Dynasty, but really to learn something about at least the gener their parents' generation. You know, if you're like. 15 years old or 20 years old, learn something about your parents and maybe even your grandparent generation post-war and really try to delve into that and, and to understand uh, this period that I, that I tried to speak about anecdotally. I mean, on the one hand, it's kind of fantastic. You can go uh, to all kinds of hotels around the world and uh, there's like four or five Chinese stations, doesn't matter where you are. And, um, and when I grew up, I remember my mother really, you know, missed being able to watch Chinese shows and so on. And, and, then, and then when uh, videotape came in, she was grateful because she could go into Chinatown and, and rent, VC, uh, rent uh, you know, uh, videotape of, uh, of Chinese shows and so on. And now, of course, you go to a hotel room, there's five, five Chinese stations, six Chinese stations and so on. So it's kind of uh, amazing in terms of the you know, at the, uh, and I feel great about the Ch China's rightful place as, as one of the most important countries and, and uh, c cultural contributors to the world. I think that's, all of that's fantastic. But I also feel saddened by, you know, the, as I mentioned, um, you know, that China is in many ways a, a capitalist country, you know, it, with different character than other capitalist country. I think that's also, and, and all the kind of um, terrible things that uh, this system of, um, of um, you know, injustice and hierarchies of people have visited upon. So I think, you know, when I see Macau, for example, the gambling casinos in Macau, I think it's, I think I cannot believe it. <laughs> it's like, it's terrible. So on the one hand, it's fantastic, um, um, you know, uh, the, greater material status of China, the greater power of China. But I also worry about uh, this uh, concentration of power, this kind of surveillance uh, economy of, of Chinese expression and, um, and so on. I think it's, it, it's untenable in the long term. So that, that's my honest answer to two or three questions. Thank you, and it's very, um, yeah, it's very, um, I would say, um, um, kind of thought-provoking, and really, I'm really grateful for your experience, personal experience, and also the critical thoughts on um, really the capitalization of Chinese market here and um, the future. Is well, I would, I would really encourage, like, um, uh, you know, uh, especially uh, art historians in China, and uh, but also artists in China to really write about art, you know, to really, uh, you know, I, I'm an artist, I, I, 
you know, writing is hard. Writing's not easy. Uh, you know, I've written a lot. I've probably written enough for like two books now. And, um, but, you know, you develop it. You know, you have to work hard at writing about it because I was, I, I, I knew no other better way to really record uh, my real deep thinking about, uh, you know, essences, what, what made the art that way. And, um, and I knew that I was always interested, not just in looking at art as art, but uh, uh, looking at art as also as, as a kind of iteration of politics, of economy, of the social sphere. And I think um, all of that requires a lot of reading, a lot of work, as they say, but it's also very rewarding when you can, when you can actually write it, write it down and, and affect uh, discussion points about the status of art, the status of, uh, of Chinese society, for example. So I encourage um, you know, young Chinese artists and so on who, who are, want to make a name for themselves to um, you know, open up a space of distinction by not just making art, but also to theorize about art, not just their own art, but, uh, but art in the broader context of, of, uh, of uh, the formation of a society. Um, yeah, and actually uh, speaking of criticism, and um, we have a question that is going back to issue journal and what do you think of the relationship between issue and art criticism in China over the years and what kind of criticism uh, do you think uh, has issue fostered and promoted and also what is its shortfalls? I, I think issue is still a, uh, an incomplete project. Right, and I think that's what's great, great about it. Right, it's an incomplete project, and what I mean by that is that I think Yi Shu, in some ways, has has gone to li limits of what it can do and can say and can deliver. Right, and um, and much of that change needs to take place within China itself, where where you 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 actually have to have a developed a much larger critical mass of theorizers, of, of writers, of critical thinkers on art and culture in China. That also needs to take place in a much larger number uh, and much more effective numbers uh, than, than has been the case. And of course you have, you know, kind of brilliant people there. I see Carol Liu here. So, I, you know, and Hu Han Ru and all, all kinds of people. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a much more bro bigger uh, group and, and that, to the point whereby there's the, there's indis, it becomes indisputable in terms of this kind of dialogue about you know uh, what are the most salient issues, what are the most important issues, what are the uh, you know the the, the big, biggest issues that people need to think about, and what are the issues that are still unresolved um, in terms of the history of the last say 40 or 50 years. In, you know, politically, economically, socially, artistically, right? And and that um, that absence, I would say, um, is not the fault of Yi Shu. That absence is something which is beyond the the um, possibility of Yi Shu to perform. Yi Shu can, has tried, I think, to foment as much as possible the development of that, but at some point, um, you know. You, you, there needs to be um, maybe um, openings within China itself that allows for that fomentation to really establish establish itself in a in a genuine and and uh, sustainable way. Um, so, in the process of editing um, and writing, what do you enjoy or benefit the most from? Sorry, can you say that again? Um, like in the process of editing a issue journal, and what do you enjoy or benefit the most from? And well, I, 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 I always, I always enjoy. Um, I, I feel very lucky uh, when I was editing issue that I was not just editing, but that I was also, and not just kind of putting my stamp on it. That's that's a very arrogant way of putting it, but that I was also learning things. Right. I, I, I remember lots of times I go, oh, okay, that's interesting. I didn't know that. I'm, I'm uh, a person who's always curious and I'm always wanting to learn more and wanting to know more. 
I think that's made me a be better professor, by the way, because I, 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 I am always hungry to, to know more. And that's why, as I said earlier, I like to write. You know, it's not that writing is easy for me, but I developed a facility for writing because I, I found it was the best vehicle for um, learning, right? But, and that learning always falls back on me. And that learning is about learning about myself in the world, right? Because I'm an artist first and foremost. And so that's what I enjoy, enjoy the most, right? It, I mean, I enjoy, I enjoy this session today, tonight, because I enjoy thinking about, and, and I think I've thought about all these questions for a long time. I you know, you know, I think about a lot of different questions. I think about Africa. I think about the time I was in Martinique. I think about my, when I was teaching in France. I think about lots of things, right? But China holds a very special place in that. And I think, um, and uh, I learned a lot from uh, Yishu. I learned a lot from uh, Zhou Shantian, by, by the way. And I'm not just kind of complimenting him because he's here, right? But I think uh, Zhou Shantian is really the giant kind of, of um, you know, historically, and his only fault is he's too modest. You know, he's too modest to ever claim anything. Because he's, a, he's a nice guy, right? But actually his contribution is like gigantic uh, in terms of this kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, tying uh, uh, and negotiating, uh, you know, art, uh, contemporary art and language and, and so on. His contribution is like, I can't think of a more important figure uh, in, in in terms of development of um, and and the dissemination of uh, contemporary art uh, from a from a kind of writerly point of view and theoretical point of view than Zhang Chengtian. Yeah, we had a talk with Zhang Chengtian a couple of weeks ago, um, and the recording is also exhibited and in our um, gallery space. So uh, any audience who is interested uh, or who are currently in Beijing, they can come to visit us. Um, and continue with the last question. So uh, in what ways have um, the editing job and also writing in general have affected your current research and artistic career? Um, well, it's uh, in a way it, it kind of hindered it <laughs> in certain ways because you know the the western art world is very if you're an artist is based on a very a gallery system where you're part of a member of a gallery and then you have a show every two or two two and a half years and they don't like it if uh you say well you know like when i was working with um john chen tian and joanne bernie dansker on uh shanghai modern which is a big uh, exhibition um i had to postpone my scheduled show in new york Right at, at that at that time, I won't mention the gallery, but it was a very big gallery, and um, and I told the gallery that uh, you know I couldn't do it because I had to devote my time to this exhibition. I was really interested in the creation of knowledge, and uh, that that exhibition, uh, this kind of er moment, this kind of foundational moment in in China from 1919 on uh, was, and I thought that was really important. But none of that mattered to the gallery. That, that represented me. And uh, that was my, that was, I never had a show there again after that. So because I was devoting my time to doing things that were kind of academic. So, you know, the art world um, likes to talk about, at least in the Western art world, likes to talk about how they appreciate artists who are independent and to, and so on. But it's still very much a kind of business model. And, um, and, uh, and I've always been independent, I, I, at least, I've always tried to be as independent as I can from that model. And that's part of the reason why I write, and that's part of the reason why I curator, it's part of the reason why I started uh, Monument Lab, and so on. These things take a lot of time, take a lot of work, right? They, they take a lot of time and work from time and work towards making art for, uh, for art shows, right? But I also think, you know, at some point, it's also a little bit boring just being an artist. I don't. I've, I've never been totally satisfied with just being an artist. I don't know why, it's just, uh, right? But um, I've always been interested in learning more about art, partly through travel, partly through occupying different positions within the art system, curator, writer, critic, teacher, artist. And so I continue on that path. Thank you. 
Um, and we have a couple questions in our, um, from our audience, so I'm going to um, um, read them out. Um, so Chen Xi'an asks um, a few. The first one, so the, it's about the, the name of an issue which he personally messaged us, and I'm going to read it out loud. Uh, because, um, you know, the, the journal issue is taking its name from uh, the uh, NG, NKA Journal of Contemporary African Art. So uh, he asks, um, hello, Ken, I'm wondering if you can share more thoughts in line of comparing the directions and patterns of NKA and Ishu. And he also asks, um, I'm wondering if you can share more thoughts in lines of comparing the directions and patterns of, yeah, it's the same question. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I mean, NKA is much more um, tied um, institutionally, right? The founding editor and founder was Salah Hassan, and he's a professor in, 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 and director of Africana Studies at Cornell University, which is a major, major well-funded university. And so, you know, it, it was always affiliated with uh, Cornell and it, it, was, it had in place this kind of distribution network uh, within academia, right? Whereas Yishu uh, isn't quite the same. Yishu was never affiliated institutionally with the, with the university. And, uh, and, and, and so NKA tended to be, not exclusively, but tended to be a little bit more academically uh, focused than um, Yishu. Yishu, uh, you know, often would have all kinds of different, um, not that it wasn't academic, but it was more like a art, art magazine slash academic journal. And um, that would be the uh, largest points of uh, comparison, I, I would say, you know, um, but um, I don't know whether we, we, we were, we modeled ourselves in NKA, maybe is that what Zhang Chen Tian said, right? But, but I would say, you know, we didn't have that kind of institutional support, right? We, we had, you know, a, a wealthy uh, backer, uh, you know, uh, from Taiwan, but we didn't have, um, uh, you know, a kind of institutional support at such as a major university. And, and that, of course, really changed the tenor of, um, of, of, of it. But NKA was also was very important because NKA because I wrote for NKA, NKA is very important because uh, you know it was also during a time when um, or prior to the time when there was a uh, emerging interest in, due to globalization of um, art from Africa, right and so on. So in Africa is you know a very important uh, obviously continent, right and um, and. Uh, you know, and with its roots in all kinds of trauma in terms of the black body. And, um, and that was, uh, that is the salient um, character of that magazine, right? It, it preceded the kind of opening up of, of uh, contemporary art um, uh, around the world, right? So, and that was the importance of it. And that was all, all, certainly our aspirations within uh, Yishu. The, the other, I would say the other difference is that, you know, China in a very short time, I said earlier that th there was no infrastructure in place initially, which also created a more po uh, possible scenario for art in China, ironically. But now there's all kinds of infrastructure. There's contemporary art museums and private museums and exhibition spaces in many, many uh, large cities in China. That's still not the case in much of Africa. Uh, infrastructure is not there, right? But but there's a lot of interesting artists there as well. And there are also um, questions on kind of the reading mode and um, and um, writing. So Rachel Wan asks asks how do you think the changing modalities of reading has affected writing and criticism in China? For example, WeChat and um, Yo Yang uh, asks. How do you think the growing videos, uh, as and as such as um, TikTok, Instagram, will affect the visual art field due to the, due to it gains more public users and obtains enormous social resources now? Yeah, I mean, I I think both questions are tied together because, you know, I mean, especially during this pandemic, um, you know, in I don't know about China, but 
you know, uh, Zoom, Zoom meetings is the thing now, right? And uh, of course you have virtual exhibitions everywhere now. So there's all, all kinds of virtual opening, virtual exhibitions that's taking place. And that's in a way a kind of extent, and Instagram is a, is a format that, in which a lot of people see art, right? And so, I mean, it can have a deleterious effect because the question then becomes, well, is, can it, is it a good thing that Instagram reception of art, the presentation of art on Instagram or on a virtual platform, can that replace the uh, physicality of experience uh, in a gallery? The very more intimate relationship, right? I mean, on the one hand, you could say, well, maybe that's, maybe it can because it's more uh, a testament to the real conditions of today. And, uh, and maybe that also is a testament to the, to the fact that art itself um, is not, sh should also change with the times, even in terms of its technological delivery. But I also think, um, and maybe it's because of my age, I also think there's something very special about walking into a gallery and having a, um, a real intimate haptic relationship with a work of art, right? I think the danger of, um, and this is true for WeChat too, in terms of the modalities question, um, is that, uh, you know, there, there, it's not that there's a kind of a dilution or kind of corruption of the experience, but that making art has always been about material production. And the material production has the risk of um, conforming to the delivery system of um, WeChat or the de delivery system of Instagram. So we write according to the limits of the technology as presented by WeChat, or we make art that uh, would look good on Instagram as opposed to look uh, that might look good if you're standing right in front of it. I think that's a real debate. I don't have an answer for that, but I think that's a real serious debate that's taking place. And Yo Yang also follows um, the last question that is, do you think the SNS will change the power structure of art scene and even the power structure of art production as well? Um, well, I think art's always changing, um, right? So, you know, that's a kind of a cop-out answer, but I think art is always changing because due to, uh, you know, any kind of technology and so there's always, I remember when the fax machine was around and suddenly there was fax art, right? And there's mail art before that. And um, so it's constantly changing, all right? Even the kind of uh, franchising of, of super galleries um, around the world, uh, which is modeled on basically like McDonald's or something, where you have franchises. I mean, that's also a kind of reflection of the change in terms of the capitalist system, right? It's built infiltrated art, so it always changes. So the power structure, but, but in terms of, um, you know, and that question of power structure of art is very important today because at least let's say in the United States and maybe much of the West, because there's been a real social reckoning, like the Black Lives Matter movement and, and uh, the Me Too movement, and uh, a demand uh, for um, correcting, uh, you know, uh, so, uh, the injustices that have gone on too long uh, in, in, in not just society, but in the art world itself, right? And so there's a lot of demands on that. And, um, and so it, it gives me hope that, um, and you know, I, I would also add that, um, you know, over the last 40 years, there's been an amazing kind of uh, widening in, in, in ter terms of the question of who could be represented as an artist. When I started, there was very few contemporary artists with my skin color. There were some, and there were some uh, African-American artists, there were some, of course, but we were the exceptions. It was very, very small, right? And the expectation, I remember meeting curators and they'd say, oh, I didn't know you were Chinese. And then I'd say, does that change how you look at my art? And of, and of course it did, right? But they would always say, oh, no, 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 of course not. So art's always changing, but I think the power, but I think the way you change the power structure of art is to call attention to it through your work.
And I'm going to read out the last question before we um, come to an end because I know it's getting late in Philly there. So um, Sonia Lee uh, says, hello, Ken. I really enjoyed your description of your initial visits to China. Uh, I grew up also in Canada and I'm wondering if the types of mo more robust text about Chinese contemporary art may exist in other publications where we side with organizations uh, written in Chinese or simply aren't circulated because they are not translated into English, or maybe other audience members might know. And Chen Xian also follows uh, that there were catalog essays attached to the international exhibits showing, uh, showcasing Chinese art. So I. I think Ken was referring to the art periodical presenting on form essays. Yeah. No, I wasn't. I wasn't saying that there weren't um, good people and 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 important texts. What I was saying was that it, there wasn't enough of a kind of comprehensive critical mass of texts, whether it's in a co compilational form, such that the collection of texts becomes like the book of record to be uh, read, to be disputed, to be challenged, to be built upon. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying there are like some texts, you know, I mean, I, I can, uh, that have been written are very important, but I, but I would say that there, there hasn't been a kind of um, book of texts or sufficient number of texts that, that you can say that, did you read this book? Right, I don't. You can even say you don't agree with it, right? But that would be the book of record that in which people can uh, agree is a book of record with with many important texts, and that people can challenge, and that can also be built upon. That's what I'm saying is is absent uh, in, in Chinese uh, contemporary art. I'm not saying there aren't, you know, like Wu Hong is kind of a brilliant writer. And so on. There's lots of, you know, there's, there are a number of them, but I, I'm saying that, but they tend to be a little bit scattershot if you start looking at the text, right? They're important texts, but there aren't enough kind of like compiled in, in, in like in the West, you, you have this all the time with the open university system in, in Britain, for example, you have all these books and or University of Manchester books or Yale University books, University of Chicago books, University of Minnesota books. They're constantly coming out, and they build upon each other. I would say there's not that in in terms of Chinese contemporary art yet. Of course, you have catalogs and and so on. You have these kind of instances, and of course they have value, but that's not what I'm quite I'm, what I'm talking about. Thank you, Ken. Uh, we all have to continue to work on that as institutional as individuals. Mm -hmm. um, and thank you again, Ken, for your very rich sharing today. Uh, we appreciate it very much. And to all of you who are listening to this online talk, um, please also follow our next talk on 23rd of January. Next time we are going to have a conversation with Keith Wallace. Um, he was the editor-in-chief of Issue from 2004 um, to two, uh, 2020. Um, and we are uh, we, we, of course, are looking forward to it. And if you are currently in Beijing, please come to visit us. Um, today's talk will be posted in our exhibition space. Um, thank you again, Ken, for sharing your time and experience with us. And thanks to everyone who joined us today. Thank you. Thanks very much. My pleasure. Thank you thank so you. much. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. <laughs>